So hello everybody and welcome to Global Accessibility Day at Sight and Sound Technology. It's the third Thursday in May and whilst we all find ourselves in lockdown and at home, we can come together to talk about all things accessibility related with two great speakers. My name is Stuart Lawler. Uh, I work in Sight and Sound Technology heading up operations here in um, Ireland and um, I've also in the last couple of weeks taken on a, a semi content creation role for lots of our webinars and podcasts. Uh, with me in the room is our Chief Executive Officer, Glenn Tukey, and Glenn and myself are going to keep the fires burning for the next hour whilst we talk all things accessibility with our two speakers. If you'd like to engage with us during the session, you can raise your hand by pressing Alt and Y if you're using a PC, Command and Y if you're using the, a Mac, or on a mobile platform, you can, uh, you can activate the raise hand button, which is usually found in the more options section of your Zoom app. If you'd like to chat during the session, you can press Alt and H on Windows, Command and H on the Mac, or activate the chat button on your mobile app and um, Glenn is going to be keeping an eye on the chats and the raised hands and we can allow you to speak if you'd like to ask a question. So I'm going to hand over to Glenn Tuckey, our CEO, who's going to say a few words and who's also going to help us by introducing our panel and telling you a little about them. Glenn. Yes, uh, good evening everybody, thank you very much. Stuart, well Global Accessibility Awareness Day, uh, poignantly I think, arrives, uh, it's the third Thursday in, Mar in May every, every year, but we arrive here this year where it's never been more important, uh, is it? You know, it's now not a nice to have because everybody listening to us here tonight and probably operating every day in their lives, whether it be personal or in their business lives, are absolutely requiring and relying on the digital media to, um, just, to just to engage with people, just to talk and do their job, um, so it's not a nice to have now. In fact, we uh, we were invited onto a partners platform to run a webinar, uh, and we couldn't do that because Stuart, our superb host, um, uh, couldn't actually operate uh, and facilitate the platform because it wasn't accessible. It's a big, well-known name. I won't say who it is, but we're here on Zoom, which we can operate. So we we find even ourselves every day that not everything uh, is accessible and now. It's actually critical and crucial. If you want to get about life, you, you have to be uh, able to, to, to do that if you've got a disability uh, in any way. So tonight we're going to talk about all things um, uh, accessibility, tech issues, social issues, educational issues, and probably infrastructure issues as well, because a lot of it comes from where the whole thing is starting to be put together. And, and to kick this along and to get those logs burning, we've got uh, two... Uh, two of our best friends with us actually, uh, Dr. Mark McGuinness, who is an accessibility specialist at Skillsoft. Um, he's uh, currently, well, he spent 13 years before that at NCBI and he founded their uh, Centre for Inclusive Technology and he's carrying out research and technology in web, mobile and TV accessibility. So all platforms covered there by uh, Mark. He's been centrally involved in many Irish and European uh, inclusion initiatives, including the creation of the Irish National Accessibility Guidelines, Europe, European Digital Accessibility Standard, uh, and uh, I would say he's well qualified to be chucking logs onto the uh, onto the fire. And he's partnered by Robin, Robin Spinks, um, who uh, works as the Senior Innovation and Technology Relationships Manager at the ONIB, and uh, he's involved in many, many strategic partnerships, many that I've been following and involved in over the years. And you're doing a fantastic job there. Uh, um, graduating, I see looking at your bio here in social policy uh, and completing a postgrad uh, professional training and, and career careers advisor as well. So maybe you can give us a few tips actually on how to get back <laughs> into work Robin, as we go through this, because a few of us uh, may well be uh, sadly suffering uh, as well, so that might be a little byproduct as we get to the end. But anyway, I'll stop waffling on and invite you all to join in with us. Um, I'll try and keep up with the hands and the chats, but uh, uh, Stuart, over to you and the team to uh, kick this off. 
All right, thanks, Glenn. Uh, thanks for the for that, and um, we will go back to you occasionally to monitor the chat and the questions. And please, to everybody who's here today, keep keep engaging, keep your questions and comments coming. Um, Robin, I'm 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 going to start with you for a sec because you, when we were chatting about this last week, you were talking to me about last year when you were speaking at a number of different um, events and you were describing the, the thing that you were kind of racing across London from one event to another. And you were thinking as you were doing that, this should be global accessibility, should be um, a digital um, event that you can present from your home if you wish. And here we are doing this this year. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? That some, in some ways we're all on this equal platform. Yeah, it's bizarre, Stuart, isn't it? That it takes a global pandemic to actually facilitate several years of digital transformation. And I think that's what's happened for a lot of people is they've had the ambition to digitally transform services. And actually the pandemic has brought about a necessity almost overnight to transition all sorts of services into a digital and online format. And you're quite right, this time last year, I did three uh, speaking slots on Global Accessibility Awareness Day in different parts of London. And anyone who's traveled around London will know that it's a, it's a big place. It can take you an hour to get from one place to another. Sometimes I would be on the outskirts. And actually a lot of time was spent traveling. And you know what, what I'm really aware of this year is that for a lot of people with different disabilities, traveling is really difficult and it might need a lot of preparation. So it's ironic that actually our desire to make things more digital and, and to transition to that has actually been accelerated. I think we've got to see that as one of the kind of silver linings in this cloud. You know, it's actually facilitated a situation where a lot of employers are now saying things like, well, do you know what? We can work quite well with lots of people based at home. We thought it was going to be a problem. That's why we were hesitant about it. But actually what we've seen is that in lots of cases, productivity has gone up. People are more focused. People are supporting one another online, but they're able to actually get the job done from home in the same way that they can do from a, from a big shared office. So I think, it, I think it throws lots of interesting questions into this space for, for the future. It, 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 is, it is really interesting how, you know, how COVID-19 has, has actually leveled the playing field to some respects. I was telling someone the other day that meetings I've been at in, in the past where somebody might hand out something in print, may have you know, uh, forgotten to email it in, in advance. Now everybody's getting the emails and, and we're all sort of accessing this information in the same way. So definitely some pluses to be found in the midst of a, a really difficult time. Mark, I, I, I want to chat a little bit about something that, that's become very prevalent. Um, in particular, I suppose, since the start of COVID, everyone's talking about e-learning, online learning, and those um, environments and platforms, and there are a myriad of them. Uh, and, and there's no doubt they're going to be used more into the future as we have this kind of blended learning approach. We're hearing about sort of some face-to-face, -face, some online next year in our schools and colleges. What's, what, what do we need to be I suppose, kind of cognizant of as we go forward and, and start to use these platforms a little more. And I suppose with, for, for people who are using um, access technology, what's going to be important for us to enable us to use them? Um, well, actually, I, I think e-learning was already becoming really, really important before COVID. Um, e-learning has become much more accessible and in particular through mobile devices. And I think anybody who commutes is well aware that a lot of people, I, I used to talk to people on the train. <laughs> you don't talk to anybody anymore because everybody's sitting there looking at their smartphone. Absolutely everybody with a pair of headphones on. Um, and it's the same on the buses. And a lot of those people are actually doing online learning uh, because people, I think, have, have begun to realize that it's, it's essential to do this for your your job progression and there's a lot more um, I suppose flexibility people changing jobs changing careers and people are always needing to learn new things um, so even if they're not being told by their their organizations that they need to do this online learning and a lot of people uh, increasingly are um, they are choosing to do it themselves so e-learning was becoming essential anyway um, now it's become even more essential um, and I guess in order to kind of think about the challenges you have to see how complex 
this is e-learning because mm. it, it ranges from everything from just looking at videos and that could be like you know i go on youtube and i find a, a video about how to fix my washing machine or how to fix my quad right <laughs> um uh, how to there's, there's loads there's hundreds of videos on how to fold a fitted sheet <laughs> Right. So <laughs> this is all e-learning, right? <laughs> basically, it's just videos, and and it's kind of simple. YouTube is actually a very accessible platform, um, but if you're talking about the kind of e-learning that, for instance, my company Smart um, Skillsoft offers, um, you're talking not only videos. You're talking about an entire learning management system, where you might have been assigned learning tasks, and you need to track them, um, and you've got completion dates and stuff like that. Then you've got tests and you've got to do these tests and it involves um, doing um, like multiple choice questions. And uh, we're very, we're very interesting. We have some of these questions in our tests that involve ranking things. You're asked to rank things in a particular order. Um, and we did some user testing. We've been doing the user testing just recently. And we found that the ranking questions are really, really easy to use with the screen reader. And the screen reader users have told us, you know, well done for making this accessible this is this is brilliant you know i can understand how to do it and do it and i know that i've got everything in the order that i want so but there's a there's a lot of challenges in things like that because normally uh, originally they were designed to drag around the screen you drag them yeah. using a mouse into a different order right so there's all this complexity then there's things like um, areas where you practice your skills particularly in programming so it's like a walled garden now that's an entire new interface then you've got things like um, chatting with a mentor so you've got these chat um, voice chat and and um, um, text chat as well in that and then of course you've got webinars which we're going to discuss an awful lot so I won't go specifically into that but You've got this hugely complex system and then you've got the content and it's really important for instance that the content has access services audio description captions and transcripts mm. right um and it's very interesting that as a, again as a company i don't want to be sounding like i'm blowing my own trumpet but i'm only saying this because you know we discovered this quite recently we're looking at one of our competitors um, who famously doesn't have much audio description because they say they do their courses in such a way that they don't require them. The presenters try to explain everything so they don't rely on visuals. So there's nothing to describe. Now, we found with some of the things that we've looked at that, that that's not entirely correct. There's some things where you will always need audio description and particularly the more technical courses, things you know, like how to use a piece of software, how to do programming in a particular language. There's so much on screen that the presenter cannot describe and they rely on people being able to see it. You need audio description for that. Otherwise somebody is not going to be able to learn that content. Um, so the, the content, it all ultimately boils down to the content is the most important thing. <coughs> content is king, isn't that what they say? Content, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. and it's, it's about the accessibility of that content. I've got a hand yeah. up here from Patsy, so uh, it okay. might be worth picking that up. Uh, let's, let's bring Patsy, Patsy you in. Can, you, you, can, you can talk. Uh, I've unmuted you, I think. Yeah, I think you might have to, once you just tap your mute, I think, Patsy, unmute yourself once we, we've unmuted you now. Yeah, you're on mute. So if you want to, uh, yeah. yeah, we got you. We have you. Learning, which is something I've struggled with since the early 2000s, more at an higher educational level, where the content, as um, you've just said, the audio bit is not available. For example, you will have a paper that you need to read but because of copyright, they would send you this paper as a picture. Yeah. Therefore, the audio does not pick that up. And you then have this difficulty of straining a vision, which is poor, to be able to read sometimes a six or seven page um, article that you then have to answer a question on. Is there some way around that? Well, I think, Stuart, you could probably talk about copyright issues. I think I know, I don't know much about that myself, but I know that copyright has always caused problems for um, the provision of materials in alternative formats 
that are required by people with various types of sensory disabilities? Yeah, I mean, um, the Marrakesh Treaty, uh, Bookshare, there, there are two, two things that come to mind straight away. Uh, RNIB Bookshare is now well, well up and running um, and, and well established. Um, Robin, I don't know if you, if you want to talk, if you can mention anything about RNIB. Yeah, Bookshare. absolutely. I mean, Bookshare is a big resource that's growing very fast. It's been really successful and you can actually sign up. Anyone can sign up for Bookshare. Anyone who's a student or teacher or support member um, in learning and education. And the intention there really is to make sure that the materials are available, the titles are available accessibly to anybody who needs them. So I think the first question, I've had this from quite a few parents, actually a similar question about, about their, their children's education. If you get something that's been scanned in, you know, the quickest fix that a lot of people will go with is I'll try and use a piece of software that will scan that. Now that, that might instantly be able to read the text out to you, but it's not a solution to the problem. Initially, what I would say is contact the person who sent you the material and find out if you can have the, the original source of that material. But Bookshare, you know, has a massive number of titles and it's growing extremely quickly. Um, that, that would be one of the first things I think you should check out and see whether the title is available there. It's been a big problem since the start of this pandemic and indeed before it. But I guess this has just heightened awareness of it, particularly with things like Google Classroom, where people have just been taking any kind of material, scanning it super quickly, putting it up there. And you're quite right. You know, if you are, <clears throat> if you're trying to access that material using eyesight, it's quite easy. But if you're like me, and you're visually impaired and you're trying to do that, it's a, it's a nightmare, you know, as, as I'm sure you've discovered. And actually, I think, I think having access to Bookshare, but also having contact with the people who've sent you the material, and from an accessibility standpoint, can you get access to a text-based version of that? Even if that's e-text, or it's audio, or a format that's going to work for you, it's a big challenge, and it's one that I think often people feel like technology has actually overcome that challenge but actually we all need to keep plugging away with the requests and and, and tap into those resources that are available yeah I, this has actually been an issue for us for my company doing e-learning material that publishers i think it's with audiobooks we want transcripts and publishers will not provide them um they um you know I, I don't know if those are copyright issues, legal copyright issues, but they won't do that. So sometimes you cannot, literally, you, you, you can't get the content to deliver in an, in an alternative format. And I, think, I guess that's what the, the issue that Patsy is facing. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an interesting uh, related one, which is an age, age old question that Tolga asks. Uh, um, and he's saying, you know, he often comes across uh, PDFs which are just not uh, accessible. That's true. Uh, and it's been around for so long. Uh, he asked the question, and I wonder what the panelists think about that, because you know I've been in this industry only 12 years. But from the start, the thing I chatter on about all the time is, well, PDFs, you may be sent them, but they may not be accessible to you mm -hmm. as your user, which you think so many years down the line, people would know that by now. Why don't they know it, guys? Let, let's let's mm. let's put that one let's put that one to Mark first uh, because I know Mark and I would have probably talked about this many times in NCBI <laughs> and, and <laughs> uh, I don't know Mark what do you think about PDFs? It is an interesting one. Um, one thing I'd say PDFs they're they're almost in terms of accessibility like this this forgotten corner that people want to forget, um, which is kind of strange because on a lot of websites I mean I've been auditing websites for centuries. And on a lot of websites, particularly like government websites and things like that, maybe 90 or 95% of all the information on the website is in PDF format, mm -hmm. not on the web. And they make an effort to make the website accessible, but they have all these PDFs that they're not only not remediating the legacy PDFs, they're not even making sure they have a, a, a process in place to make the, the, the new PDFs they're producing accessible. Um, now, the other thing I would say, um, is if you if you work in accessibility circles you'll find an awful lot of people who know a lot about web accessibility a lot of experts who can tell you how to do it very much fewer who know much about pdf 
accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly why that is, whether there's just a smaller market for it. I mean, these things are often market driven. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but PDF is very much forgotten um, and it's seen as a lot more complicated, although the WCAG guidelines, which is the guidelines, the international standard for how to make web content accessible, applies equally to a PDF or even a Microsoft Word document or an Excel spreadsheet that's on your website as it does to the web page itself. Um, and, and legally, in terms of the Section 508 in the States and the EN 301549 accessibility requirements in Europe, um, even legally, it, the PDFs have the same standing. So they should be treated the same, but they never have been. And I, I'm not entirely sure I could answer why. I think it's a, I, I, it's a really interesting point, uh, I, and I just you've you've prompted because something has come into my head. When a couple of years ago we were, I was working with somebody. We were trying to make a PDF form um, accessible to a screen reader, and we discovered that the tools that are provided to make it accessible are themselves not accessible to a screen reader because you have to visually drag blocks uh, of text together. So it was kind of really it was an interesting experience for me to go through this and realize actually I can't do this. Yes, you do get a lot of cool tools that people use to produce the document in the first place that would, they might produce it in Microsoft Word and then export to PDF or some other program and export to PDF and the PDF that it exports is nowhere near accessible. Having, having done that, you have a hell of a technical job to fix it up. It can be quite um, time consuming to do that. Okay. I've got a related uh, question actually, while, while, you, while you're covering off standards and bodies. Uh, Nikki Dixon asked, uh, as, a, as a visually impaired person, I frequently encounter websites and learning platforms which are difficult to navigate or totally inaccessible. Question, is there an organisation whose role is to alleviate such issues? So it's all well and good there being standards that people should follow, but who's taking a proactive role in you know, fixing it, I guess, is Nikki's question. Uh, and maybe, uh, Robin, this might be one for you. I know Nikki's yeah, in the UK. I mean, I think it, it is... Um, on the type of website so for example if it's a government website oh i think we're losing robin there your audio is still there your audio's gone a bit funny yeah we can we got you now i think yeah okay um in the uk the equality and human rights commission would be the body that would have responsibility if we were talking about a public sector website I think it's a valid question because when we ask ourselves this uh, a lot, you know, we get involved in web accessibility on a commercial basis. Very often we'll also have members of the community saying, look, I cannot use this. Can you help us to advocate to the company or organization? We will always do that. If people want to get in touch and tell us about something they can't use, we'll work with them to make a representation and, and to ask for that service to be fixed. But I think it raises a broader question in terms of enforcement of the legislation that exists in the UK and around Europe. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for genuine, not just enforcement, but also monitoring. So for example, a top 100 or a top 50 on an annual basis that is actually audited and monitored and people can have a ranking. So if you're in the travel industry, Maybe there's an accessibility ranking for your website. Once you start to introduce that kind of element, people become interested in competition. People love competition. And that would be one way that we could draw attention to this um, at a much broader level. But I, I think it's an area where there's a lot more focus needed. I think there's a lot more intervention from government in, in terms of laws, accessibility laws. Um, there's, there's a huge job to be done. Many, many digital services are not yet accessible in the way that they need to be. Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, uh, just before we go on, because we have a, a couple of issues that are you know, really kind of big issues to go through, but uh, Glenn, I don't know if there was a couple of hands. Is there anything else you want to? Yeah, to? yeah there is. There's, uh, well, Tolga uh, still has his hand up. You've uh, covered off the first part, uh, but also Sandy Bannister's uh, uh, um, uh, been uh, wanting to speak as well. So let's see if I can pick uh, 
um, so Sandy up. Uh, okay, Sandy. We'll just have to. We'll just have okay, to. Okay. Yeah, um, I presume it. I'm coming over loud and clear. Um, you are indeed. I work in local government, and um, I've worked there for some time. So, so I need to access documents as PDFs myself, or my colleagues will often send me things and say, "Can you check whether that's accessible to you?" And if they're not, um, what I struggle with is I'll tell them it isn't accessible and they'll say, why not? And can you point us in the right direction for finding out, you know, what we need to do to fix it? And it would be really helpful at times. I don't know if there is anything, but just to have something I can say, go, you know, go and visit that page and, and it'll tell you more because I'm no IT expert. I just know I can't use it. OK, I think this is definitely one for Mark. Yeah, I would say if you're going to tell them one thing, go to the Adobe website. They have yep. a very good accessibility. OK. Um, thing and it tells you about how to do it using their tool adobe acrobat pro which you really have to use it's you know, i mean there are other things but adobe acrobat pro that's and helpful. a lot of really good information starting from the beginning as well okay cheers thank you very much sandy thanks for the question uh glenn did you have anybody else waiting in the way yeah uh, i've got uh eleanor who's actually asked a question so i'll uh, i'll pick her up to talk uh, um Let's uh, just see if we can get you on there, Elena. Hang on. Okay, and just while we're doing that, to remind people if you want to raise your hand, uh, Alt and Y, uh, or Command and Y if you're using a Mac, or raise your hand button if you're using the app, you're more than welcome to ask questions. So uh, uh, I've, I've got Elena online now. Tolga's still got his hand up, um, and uh, Claudia's coming as well. I'd, We'll pick off a couple of these, but then uh, I think we'll move yeah, on we, and we'll make sure we to... capture them before the end. Yeah. So, definitely. Eleanor, you, you asked a question offline, actually, about the Apple iPhone. Is that what you want to talk about now? Hi, Le Eleanor. Are you, are you out there? I think she's muted. Hang on. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you now. We have you. Okay. Um, I did send in an email, but before that, I would just like to ask about Google Drive, which I find quite inaccessible, but which I would have to use and share with people. And what are you using it with, Eleanor? What assistive technology? Is it magnification or screen reading? The iPhone. The iPhone, okay. I, I'm not sure who, Robin, I don't know if you've used it. If you, I, I personally haven't used Google Drive on the iPhone, so I'm... I think it's I think it's like a you know the story is similar to with a lot of apps that the accessibility seems to kind of the as the app is updated the accessibility comes and goes. What my advice with it would be, and I know that other people have experienced a similar problem, would be to to contact accessibility at google.com, but also to look at the accessibility page um, on on Google. It's google.com/accessibility. Um, and, and the other thing that might be worth doing on this one is Apple Viz in terms of tips and tutorials on how to navigate. Because I think sometimes what happens, and I haven't, I haven't looked at Google Drive on the iPhone uh, for a little while, but sometimes what happens is changes to the app just make it more, more difficult or different to access from, from how it has been previously. So, um, yeah, I, I think the first point of call is always to go to the stable that that app comes from, and that would just be go to Google. Google have a lot of visually impaired people working in their engineering teams as well. Um, and I, I've certainly reached out on a couple of issues and found that, that the support has been, you know, has been positive. So I'd suggest that in the first instance. Excellent. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Robin. And um, Eleanor, thank you for your query. Uh, let's just take one more, Glenn, and then we'll go on to our next uh, our next topic. Uh, I've got uh, uh, Claudia who uh, has uh, been asking a couple of questions on the on the chat, and so let's uh, just uh, let's see if uh, they are covered off, and uh, then we'll move on, and I'll pick up the other guys in a second. Uh, Claudia, you should better talk now. Hello. Hi, okay. Claudia. We can. Okay. Well, I just want to, I don't want to answer my uh, queries on, because I don't think they are relevant, but I want to refer to, to people who just talked just before me, because I may have some uh, answers for, for them for PDF accessibility and Google Drive accessibility. 
Um, if, if that's okay. If not, sure. then I can. Sure, yeah, okay. Well, for PDF accessibility, I know they are fiddly, but what I used to tell my uh, people, my, my tutors on the course or, or something, I say to them, if it is a scanned image, then the screen reader will not read it at all. And you have to, well, I don't know, find a way to convert it to Word. And the way to check this is if, obviously when you're sighted, you know, if the cursor will hover, the mouse cursor will hover over the text. If it won't, then it means that it's a scanned image. If not, then it's, it's okay and you should be able to read it yourself. So I, I had loads of questions asked, asked me about the PDF accessibility and I used to just tell them that and to be honest, it seemed to work. So, um, so that could be one of the solutions. Okay. Thank and you. as for Google Drive, I think it, it is a bit fiddly on the iPhone because you have to go this and that and, and somewhere. But I think it's pretty straightforward. It's similar to um, the files app on for the iCloud, Apple's iCloud. It's not exactly the same, but I would say it's a very similar interface. And if we, if, if people are familiar with it, then it should be okay. It's that when 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 the files are selected, they, it doesn't doesn't have to it doesn't seem to be an option for sharing multiple files at once, or if it is, it's very fiddly. But other than that, it should be should be okay. I didn't find any problems using Google Drive okay, on well, my ha- phone or on my iPad. I did find it difficult on the computer, I have to admit, but okay. not on the uh, all right. Thank you, Claudia. V- very useful information there. And thank you for sharing that. I'm going to move on and we will get back to uh, where because we're flying in terms of time, but we will get back to some other hands um, with Glenn in a little while. Um, I when um, Robin, when when you and I were chatting last week, one of the conversations we were having was the challenge. And I, I know about this personally, the challenge for um, for companies, for for specialist tech companies, I suppose, who are trying to um, who are trying to do face to face face to face meetings where technology can be shown. So for blind and low vision people in particular, who might want to hold a piece of technology in their hand, obviously we can't do that at the moment. And online meetings take place, or maybe you send somebody a piece of equipment, but there's a cost attached to that. And you were talking um, about the whole area of 3D printing some of this kit, which, which sounded really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, it's just an idea that's come to mind, you know, instead of, you know, if, you, if you're a company and you've maybe got one demo unit or two demo units of a product, and imagine this would be applicable to a relatively small portable product, one thing that surely is an opportunity is to create some 3D printed models or replicas of the product that can almost be a bit like a kind of, not quite as good as a loan device, but they could be really useful particularly for somebody who is totally blind and someone who's been congenitally blind where, you know, they want to get a sense of what does this device feel like? How are the buttons? What's the spacing like between the buttons and the background? What's the texture like? And it would be possible to convey a lot of that through a 3D printed object. I've got examples here of things that have been printed. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not as good as getting a real demo device. And I'm not suggesting that it's a complete substitute, but maybe there's a role for that in just giving people a greater awareness of what products are actually like um, prior to them, them, them actually going forward and ordering something. I mean, what, what none of us want to do is to order a product and discover we don't like it and we want to send it back. We want to try and avoid that. And I guess the opportunity might be, is there an in-between that could involve 3D printing? Yeah, and I suppose, um, especially when 3D printing is so is so cheap or certainly come down a lot in price in the last couple of years and they're printing just about mm-hmm. everything nowadays, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how many things, you know, I one example I often give is that, you know, we, uh, wife and I, with our second son was born, we went to um, have our, our scan, the, the sort of regular scans that you have in, in pregnancy. My wife is blind, I should add. And then um, I was given a piece of printed paper at the hospital with a scan image on it. And it was handed to me and not to my wife. And I'm just thinking to myself, 
which one of us is it that's carrying the child, you know? And I've been handed this piece of paper, which I could see, and I thought that's wonderful. But I also felt there was something really quite unjust about that. So I took it along the road to my friend a couple of doors along, who has a really good 3D printer, and he said, I'll be along for a coffee in five minutes. And he brought along a 3D printed version of the scan, which I was wow. then able to pass to my wife. And I thought, you know, that's how it really should be, you know? If a parent is blind, you should be able, because it's, there's no excuse on cost now, you should be able to produce an image like that straight away and say, listen, maybe this one would work better for you. It's a tactile image. We've still got it. I use it in demos just to make that very point that, you know, information is critical. People are recipients of that information, particularly if it's medical. That should just become available to you in a format that's going to work. 3D printing now is amazing. It's incredible what's possible. So uh, definitely something for the for the sector, I think. And enhanced um, by to, 3D. To, something for the sector to uh, to think about. I don't know if we're losing your audio there, Robin. Um, okay, definitely 3D printing. Uh, I, I think it's a, a really interesting idea. And let's face it, we may be we may be doing less face-to-face -face contact in general for the, for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, I wanted to talk before we go back to, I know there are hands and some questions, but before we go back to those, I wanted to talk about another issue, I suppose, linked to COVID-19, and that's how many people have been parachuted without any choice and overnight into online meeting platforms and indeed online learning and um, learning um, um, platforms, but meeting platforms, I suppose, in particular, like Zoom, for example, which we're using today. Um, my own parents, who, who never heard of Zoom prior to COVID-19, are now doing the regular Lawler Zoom quiz every week, and we have a bit of fun. That's great crack. But it's really interesting because so many people are using this stuff now and Zoom and other platforms have had to respond very quickly to keep the platform safe and secure. And, and Mark, I, one of the things I often think about is, is there a danger that, because so, so many people are using this stuff, there's so much that needs to be updated, they're pushing out updates so quickly, is it a danger that um, accessibility might sometimes get overlooked? There is a danger and it does happen, it always has happened, um, particularly um, where security is is um, concerned. Um, a lot of companies were for a while saying, no, we can't use Zoom. Um, because it's you've got all these security problems and they were you know they're real problems i mean there were some terrible instances of um people you know zoom calls being bombed with um child pornography um so they are real problems um unfortunately zoom was by far the most accessible and easy to use platform with for instance a screen reader i know i don't know about other software um so you would want to use zoom for, for accessibility, but there are other issues. Um, unfortunately, traditionally, the accessibility has always taken a bit of a backseat to a lot of issues. And it, it, even in terms of companies, it can be things like, well, you know, we've just um, invested in Microsoft, we've done a big deal, and now we're using uh, 365 online and we're using Teams, and that's it. So you're using that now because that's our platform of choice. And they didn't take into account accessibility. Now, you know, there's a lot of talk now about the new normal. Um, now, the need for accessibility and the presence of people with disabilities in workforces, in user bases, um, customer bases and stuff like that, it's, I mean, it's the old normal. It's not even new. It was always there. I just hope that there's, there will be more visibility of this um, now when these issues become... Um, much more to the fore and some people are clearly um, excluded from what is now a mainstream requirement for companies and things like that which is all this video conferencing from home quite often traditionally I think some people who and, and a lot of people who are on this call will will attest to this that if they've been employed they've often been a little bit far forgotten about and they've been pushed to the side of the office almost metaphorically um, now perhaps that won't be so much possible anymore because if people cannot use the the tools to in, to interact with their team or with their manager um, or with their staff then they you know it becomes obvious so i'm hoping 
that this will become the new normal, but it will require spending. That's the main thing. People have to, the, the new normal is going to require changing a lot of practices, which involves stopping spending on a lot of the things we used to, like buildings, but you really have to spend, and you have to spend not only money, but time in figuring out what equipment you can use that is accessible and how to set it up and how to use it and how to get everybody else using it because one of the issues that you have when you do a lot of these virtual, virtual meetings and even webinars like this now Stuart and, and um, Glenn you're, you're being really good at the way you're running this but traditionally a lot of these meetings you don't have two people you have Stuart you're the you're like the chair but you don't have somebody in this other crucial role of watching over um, the participation, making sure everybody yeah. can participate and the things they need to participate haven't broken down. And I've been in so many of these kind of webinars where halfway through somebody said, oh, by the way, the live transcript hasn't been working for 10 minutes and nobody noticed yeah, yeah. Yeah. because nobody was watching. So you, you have to monitor, you have to put in this, spend on resources to make sure people can participate and that involves um, doing things like test driving the whole thing with assistive technologies making sure that um, the sound quality because people who are deaf and hard of hearing obviously have a, have a they're probably the most affected by um, poor quality communications over um, um, over over the web um, the sound quality can be terrible purely and, and often because a company doesn't provide proper headsets and I see Stuart you've got a fantastic headset <laughs> you've got a Sennheiser it's brilliant some people are rubbish and they keep breaking and they pick up another one they've got 10 pairs of headphones and hardly none of them work yeah. and it's just you know you have to just invest in making this work for everybody and even the video quality is pretty poor most of the time and a lot of people who are hard of hearing require you know they rely on that for lip reading to help them understand and if there's a an out of sync that can be so there's all mm -hmm. these different things um, but it's an, as much about getting the procedures right and testing it and making sure everybody's on board um, and one last thing I'd say about this, this the, the interesting thing is we've got I don't know how many participants here 50, 50 right? yeah. We've, yeah. We, we can't see them. That's really makes it really difficult to know somebody's situation. If you're in a meeting room and there's somebody there who has a disability, everybody can see them. Everybody can see that they maybe take more time to make their um, their contribution. They need more time to be able to even raise their mm -hmm. hand. Um, now. Do you, in something like this, we could not see every. We, we could be in a situation where we don't see people, so we've forgotten about them. This is all procedures to make sure that this doesn't happen. And we're, we're all feeling our way in this, but we have to make disability and the effects of disability and the needs of people with disabilities very, very, very visible so that people notice it and it becomes the new normal to expect this and to learn to cope with it and put the procedures and the equipment in place. I'll just chip in there because you, you, you touched a little nerve for me earlier on in that uh, conversation um, because it is about investment. Uh, I would say from the sight and sound point of view, we have not saved money by going online. We, uh, we don't spend anything on uh, fuel and trains and airfares anymore. We put much more than we saved into uh, providing the equipment and the infrastructure to make sure we're agile to take our company online. Mm. And we didn't approach it in, oh, this is good. We can furlough some staff and get some government money and save on this. And of course, it all helps. But we knew that if we wanted to be successful in still engaging and uh, enjoying the relationship with our mm -hmm. client base, then we had to really, really put some time, effort and money into that. And uh, you, can't, you, know, you can't do it without. And we have always double handle every webinar because we've learned, we learned that um, if you want to make it a enjoyable environment and experience then you're going to have people watching it it's uh, you wouldn't go to a yeah. meeting necessarily on your own if a number of different points of view and notes have to be taken would you you know so mm -hmm. it's no different yeah there's a really interesting thing a really interesting trend we've started to see just linked to this and that is the emergence of dedicated video conferencing devices so i think facebook were first to market with a device called portal and this is a, effectively a bit like an Amazon Echo show 
So it's a display of about eight inch display. And the interesting thing about it is that it has localized AI on the device and the camera on the device actually tracks you. So if you move around as a speaker or presenter, as I do often when I'm presenting, I'm moving about. If I'm on a stage, I'll pace around. Um, it's just the way that I am. What this camera will do is it will actually lock onto you and track you. And it strikes me that that's really interesting from an accessibility perspective. And it, it could potentially be really helpful. So I think we'll start to see more dedicated conferencing devices that contain technology like that. You know, it's not happening on a server, it's happening at a local level. And actually it could be useful for, for our community. I think it's an area to, to watch and it's certainly something that we're interested in uh, contributing to. I think the I think the dry runs for sessions for meetings for these virtual uh, sessions are so important and I suppose um, as as uh, as Glenn has, has mentioned already we're doing a lot of this at the moment in sight and sound but I know if you if you bring people online for the first time and it's not a good experience from the meeting organizer perspective if something doesn't go right it's very hard to get those people back yeah. online because their faith in the technology is shattered understandably I think. Um, yeah. So, so definitely, uh, Glenn. I'm happy to go back to if there's if there are hands raised. I think there was there may have been a few and and chats going on. Yes, uh, I've got uh, Ahmed who was uh, keen to talk, and uh, Ahmed, I hope you can uh, you can. Yeah, hear. hi, hi, hi everyone. Hi Ahmed. Uh, hi, uh, great session and uh, amazing uh, information. Uh, regarding, uh, I'm using iPhone. I myself, I'm blind. Uh, I train people who are blind and partially sighted uh, as assistive technology instructor. There is one thing that I wanted to ask. Is there in UK a law that forces certain websites if they don't conform with the accessibility guidelines, like in America? That's definitely Robin's gig, I yeah. think. Yeah, so, so, so there is. So technically, um, the, the Equality Act um, and, and the enforcement in the UK is primarily when it comes to government and local authority websites. What I would say about it is that there is, I think there's a significant lag and a significant gap between the kind of responsibility for enforcement and actual enforcement. So I would, I would strongly um, urge anyone who's interested in that to get in contact with the, the EHRC, so the Equality and Human Rights Commission, specifically um, to, to, to talk about that and push specific cases. Because I think what, what, what I would say is that unless a case comes forward and someone actually wins that case and it's a high profile, it comes into the news, you know, that's what it's going to take to make a step change in the way that people think about web accessibility in, in the UK. So a lot of government websites have got, they've got a need to comply. What, what we're probably not seeing enough of is enforcement, where actually people are being held to account. And I would say if it's a private company or an organization that's not government, I would use Twitter. And Twitter is fantastic in terms of find out, and if you need to even ring up or do a bit of research, Find out who the person is in a company that has responsibility. And if you can't find that out, just hashtag the company and, you know, just, just put it plainly to them. I'm a screen reader user and actually I'm unable to shop at your business, for example. No business, no retailer wants to turn people away at the door. They want people to come into the shop and to spend money. So I think an honest sort of open way of exposing where there is a, a, a major accessibility barrier and Twitter's a great forum for it what you'll find is other people will comment they'll retweet they'll pass it on companies are becoming increasingly interested hello reasons want to take take uh, action okay so definitely yeah. yeah so definitely Twitter and I've I, I've found this myself and I've heard a lot of other people say it for Twitter for customer service you're very much in public um, and people are likely to respond. So definitely. But from your experience, is there any cases in UK uh, court that came against uh, the like uh, accessibility side of it? So what I would say is that there are many examples of people who have lodged cases against uh, organizations. What we've not seen in the UK 
are high profile cases like the ones, for example, that have come out of the US, like Domino's, for example. Um, yes. Target is a very famous one. Um, you know, and there are others. There are, there are many in the US now. We haven't seen that level of exposure and, and enforcement. And, and really, I think it, it's up to us as a community to continue to push for that, to continue to have the legislation strengthened, but also, and crucially, to have the enforcement strength, strengthened. And I think we can do our, all do our bit with that, where we encounter something that doesn't work. Let's get it out there. Let's get it on Twitter. Let's contact the company. Let's be friendly and assertive, but make the point clear that we're shoppers, we're consumers, we've got the same money as everyone else. We want to spend. That's all we want to do. And in order for that to happen, quite often people will need to make some simple adjustments. Those can even be incorporated into website or app refresh cycles or updates. And it's all part of the, the good practice of making a good usable app or service. Uh, thanks very much, Ahmed. I've got another one here Chris posted a little while ago. Any good way of remotely accessing an iPad and helping someone navigate and solve problems. So many web in, with, our, with so many webinars to catch up on, any good tips on finding the play button on a recorded session? So remote access on an, on an iPad, uh, can you pop TeamViewer on? And um, uh, you can certainly do that on an uh, Android device. Uh, and where do you find the play button when you want to listen to the uh, to Stuart's uh, gorgeous voice. <laughs> well, I think if you want to listen to my voice, don't press the play button. Um, it, and I suppose depending on the platform you're using, if we, we put most of our stuff either on YouTube or Audio Boom, Chris, so the play button, uh, if you're using a screen reader, um, certainly with JAWS and one or two other screen readers, you can press the letter B if you're in your browser, or their play button should be visible to voiceover. Uh, TeamViewer, I'm not sure Robin might have you might have thoughts on TeamViewer on iPad? Yeah, I think, do you know what I'd like to do is to take that question away and follow up with some of my, my colleagues who are, who are doing this right now and just come back with a, come back with a response if we could do that in the comments. Yeah, uh, absolutely, for, for sure. And uh, Sandy uh, asks, does the use of Twitter require targeted use of hashtags to maximise the impact? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the thing to say about it is the more that you can incorporate. Uh, I think Robin's uh, your contact uh, thing. Yeah, you'd be, the more you can do that, the more effective it will be. Okay, so the use of um, hashtags is, is definitely going to help help your case, I suppose, in the um, in the Twitter sphere, as they say. Um, okay, anything else, Len, hand-wise or questions? Uh, no, nothing. We've uh, put them all down. One I just wanted to chip in on, the, uh, on this, uh, you know, this new craze for Zoom and video conferencing is actually, I, th I think, uh, and I monitor this a lot in our business, our business works superbly well with everybody working from home, but I am seeing burnout now after eight or nine weeks. I'm seeing that people are finding it very tiring to be spending a lot of time in front of a screen because if you're in a room you can switch off a little bit and listen to what's going on around you maybe but in this conference uh, specifically i'm sure everybody's focused on the screen is looking at the uh, little windows if you can see and certainly listening to all the different voices that are coming in and paying attention and 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 i certainly find it quite tiring after a day of that and i know our team do it i've seen people picking up a week of holiday now in the business quite regularly after eight weeks of this because they're saying do you know what i'm in the same place and i just have to um you know take a little bit of time out because i'm finding it quite stressful quite tiring so there is a danger that we over communicate now we have the ability to just click and find people i don't know what people think about that yeah it's so interesting i think there's almost we're entering an era where we need to start thinking hey, them on there self. I think we just need to mute Ahmed. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I think we're we're entering an era where we need to think much more carefully about the issue of self-care. And I've been doing some sessions with my colleagues about this, really to say, look, we're actually working in different ways and under different kinds of pressures. So maybe what you need to do is just take five minutes 
that you wouldn't normally take and go outside and get some fresh air, have a stretch, go and get a cup of coffee. You know, fresh air is a fantastic thing, I think, given that we're all spending a lot more time indoors anyway. And I think everyone needs to be careful about their, their own mental health at this time. So there are some fantastic apps like Breathe and Headspace and others. And there are also guided meditations that you can get if you've got an Amazon Echo device um, that are free to use. Those kind of things are talked about a lot, you know, generally they're becoming more popular. I think they're more helpful than they've ever been at this time. And, and actually I've, I've experienced that thing of doing six or seven different Zoom calls and then really feeling quite burnt out by it and feeling yeah. the need to just flex my muscles and go outside and have a stretch or have a run or do something, maybe even just lie on the grass, which is fantastically therapeutic if the weather's nice, but just go outside and get some fresh air, take a bit of time to be in tune with how you're feeling and also connect with other people. You know, if you're feeling down or, or frustrated or fed up, call, call a colleague, call a friend, take the time out to do that. It's much more important now than it has ever been. Yeah, so important to stay well and look after ourselves. Mark, you were, uh, if certainly to my memory, the first person I knew who was working from home, I think early 2000s, I remember, and I remember going, going down to see you for meetings a few times. And I always remember, I think the first time Mark and I had a work meeting, sitting in Mark's living room. And I remember thinking, this must be great crack, you know, doing this every day. Has home working uh, changed for you over COVID-19 because there's much more people doing it? Is there more contact? Um, no, because my, my job has hardly changed at all, except that I no longer go to the office midweek. I used to go to Dublin midweek um, on the train. Um, it's a long way. Um, I no longer do that. And that was great. Um, and I love not going to Dublin, but I do miss the people. I do miss being close to people, being physically close to people. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, that kind of thing. It is... It is a problem, but yeah, I mean, the only, the biggest problem I have with video conferencing for work is my wife coming up behind me and making silly faces into the camera. <laughs> so I don't think, I don't think I have many problems. Yeah. Some, of us, some of us start off with silly faces. I was, uh, yeah, uh, I was also going to, um, uh, so I've actually lost the thread now, which I mean, funny. So we'll carry on. Then, Glenn, I'll, Glenn, I was I was just going to make the point. I was just <laughs> yeah. going to make the point that um, you and I were chatting on Monday um, for our podcast. We did a nice little piece uh, with Glenn all around um, leadership over COVID nineteen, etc. But one of the things I was saying to Glenn is that you know, Glenn and I used to talk regularly enough, and indeed, I would put this for most of my colleagues in the UK. I've been with Sight and Sound about nineteen months now. But um, I have never talked to Glenn more in the last nine, 10 weeks from when I've worked from home, when he's been at home, when lots of us are at home because we're kind of, we're, we're in touch a lot more, uh, which is really interesting. Um, so definitely there's, there's more um, engagement going on and I think there's the need for people to want to keep in touch more as well. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we're just on the hour and I'm going to, on the basis that many of us, I'm sure, have been on many Zoom meetings uh, during the day. On that note, I think it is an appropriate point to wind this session up to thank Mark and um, I suppose, first of all, to, to, to say to you guys that your um, engagement tonight and your um, input has been extremely valuable and thank you very much for helping us to mark this really important um, accessibility awareness day global accessibility awareness day at sight and sound technology uh, glenn i don't know if there's anything you want to say by way of of, uh, of wrapping up uh, only thank you so much i i love these sessions i dread them when we start going I think will we cover all the things will we get engagement are we hitting the right point and then the chats come in the hands get raised the questions come in we get talk, talking and chatting and then then i think this is the other thing we've stretched out across the whole of the uk and ireland tonight and you wouldn't do that i couldn't get everyone into northampton to have the same conversation so it definitely has uh, changed something it is definitely a new normal and one that we'll embrace uh, for, forever uh, from this point and we've learned a lot from this uh, so thank you all for helping us along the way. That's uh, what I'd like to say, yeah.
Okay, thank you very much. And um, Robin and Mark, sincere thanks for giving us your time this evening. It's very much um, valued. And uh, we, we're, we've learned a lot, I think, and we have a lot to think about uh, over the last hour. That's all from us from Sight and Sound today. Remember, lots of webinars coming up. Keep an eye on our website and social media. And uh, we look forward to chatting to you soon. In the meantime, stay safe and look after yourselves. Thank you very much.